benefit programs. They have government contracts. They do whatever they do. But when the treasury gives you the money, you take the money and you spend it on somebody else, goods and services, go out to dinner, have subcontractors, whatever it might be. That that's the, the real source of money. They also take the treasury and the Fed and they merge them. Now that's not legally the case. The treasury and the Fed are separate institutions. The treasury is just part of the executive branch. Uh, and the Fed is an independent agency, uh, and the Federal Reserve Banks are actually privately owned. Uh, that a lot of people know. Some people know that, some people don't. But the the Federal Reserve Banks are privately owned by banks in the districts so of Citibank, Bank of America, etc. Uh, so they're completely separate. But but the theorists ignore that and say no. Uh, the Treasury needs to spend money because that's how the economy grows, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So you spend the money you don't have. You borrow to cover it. You issue bonds to cover the borrowing, and if the market wants to buy the bonds, fine. But if not, the Fed can buy them and put them away on the balance sheet, wait thirty years, and collect the money. What's the problem? Who cares about the debt to GDP ratio? It's kind of a statistical abstract, but why should that stand in the way of using money to solve our problems, which are free health care, free child care, free tuition, um, forgiveness of student loans? That's a one point two. Oh, sorry, $1.6 trillion ticket, by the way. And look, everyday readers and investors, there's no reason they should know all this stuff. This is this is total inside baseball. You have to be a geek yeah. like me to kind of keep up with it, but, uh, but it's all coming. But what that means uh, is we're going to test the Rogoff Reinhardt thesis. Now, let me just take a minute to explain, my, explain that. Uh, up to a certain debt to GDP ratio, there is a uh, Keynesian multiplier greater than one. So the classic example is the UK was in a depression before the rest of the world. They have been hit pretty hard uh, before the Wall Street crash. People aren't spending, they're saving. It's the liquidity trap. So if you get money, you pay it on debt, when you don't have any debt, you put it in the bank. Whatever you do, you don't spend it. You, you hoard cash or people were buying gold, they were accused of hoarding gold, et cetera. But what they weren't doing was spending. And there was a lack of aggregate demand and the banks were not lending. So, um, so Keynes said, well, if, the, if people, if, if everyday people won't do it, the government must. The government can borrow, the government can spend. And what they discovered was that if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you can get a dollar fifty of GDP. Uh, now, there's a separate debate as to whether that's actually incremental or whether you're just pulling growth forward. But so what? Even if you are pulling growth forward, maybe that's what you need to do when you're in a liquidity trap. Um, but there's a problem. He called it uh, the general theory, you know, general theory of uh, um, employment, interest, and money. Um, but it was actually a special theory. I think he had a little Einstein on me because of the general theory of relativity. But um, it's actually a special theory, which means it's a theory that works in a set of circumstances, a set of conditions. The conditions where it works are you're either in a recession or just coming out of one. You have excess capacity and uh, uh, labor and uh, uh, industrial capacity, and you have very little debt. In those circumstances, you can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, and get more than a dollar GDP. The problem is that extra GD, that extra GDP you get for the borrowing spend, it goes down as the debt to GDP ratio goes up. What Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered is that at 90%, you go through the looking glass. Your payoff is now less than a dollar. You borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you only get 90 cents of GDP or 95 cents, et cetera. So now, not only are you not getting your dollar's worth for the borrowed dollar or something more, which you did at lower levels, you're getting less than a dollar. So now what's happening? You're borrowing a dollar, you're spending a dollar, you're not getting a dollar of GDP, but you are getting a dollar of debt, which means your debt to GDP ratio is going up and the 90% is getting worse. And I just mentioned we're, the United States is at 135%. So here are your two competing schools. There's the, the Keynesian multiplier and creating aggregate demand with government debt and the Reinhard Rogoff, more than a thesis, I would say powerful evidence that beyond 90%, it doesn't work. It goes under less than one on the one hand. And my friend Stephanie Kelton and Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris and the modern monetary theorists who say, no, it's all good. How could you get growth if you didn't spend money through the government? These theories don't agree at all. 
Mm. We're going to find out which ones work. I, 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 I'll, I'll give it. I'll give away the answer, which is that uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have it right. Keynes had it right up to a point. Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered that critical threshold that whether you want to call it tipping point or phase transition, or which physicists call it or whatever. The modern monetary theorists think the opposite, and we're going to find out. But what? But what it means if Reinhardt and Rogoff are right, and I'm right, and Keynes was right. The more you borrow, it's actually a headwind of growth. Now you get le- just as up to the threshold, you got more and more and more. Oh, sorry, it, 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 at a low level, you got more, but then it went down. But it's like any uh, diminishing marginal return. You know, the, the curve starts very steeply, you get a lot of payoff, then it flattens out, then it goes down, but it's still positive. But at some point, it goes below the zero line, and your marginal return is negative, and that's where we are. Why are those residential real estate prices going up? And, they, and the same thing's happening in the United States. The answer is that there is an exodus, and I don't think that's too strong a word, out of the cities. People are put off by. I mean, cities mm-hmm. have always been a trade-off. Cities are okay. You have a lot of noise and some dirt and some hassles and maybe a slightly higher crime rate. But on the other hand, you have art and culture and museums and shows and restaurants and, and, and bars. And so you you make the trade-off. You say, I'll accept these annoyances in exchange for all this, you know, culture and buzz. And cities attract, you know, the brightest people. So whether it's uh, you know, bankers or lawyers or doctors or artists, playwrights, actors, whatever, uh, it's just there's a lot of buzz. That's why people go to cities. With these lockdowns, we've amplified all the negatives and taken away all the positives. We've shut the museums, the restaurants, the bars, the plays, the office buildings, things that attracted people. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, again, probably not as bad in Australia as it is here, but crime is on the rise. Murder rate in New York has doubled. Uh, suicide rates across the country have tripled. And that's that's New York, the suicide rates national. Um, there are all these dysfunctions and a lot of them. And of course, when you have highly concentrated populations, which you do in cities, um, a lot of that's where. So what people are doing, and I say people, it's the people who can afford it. They're getting out of the cities and they're going to nearby suburbs or even further out what we call exurbs, which are you know the, the next ring beyond the suburbs. And so there is that demand for housing. I'll, I'll, I'd be willing to bet money that the place you're describing is a pretty attractive neighborhood. So they're, they're booming and the same thing's true in the United States. But what's the other side of that? We're depopulating our cities. Cities are the greatest wealth generating phenomena in the history of civilization. I mean, that's what civilization means. It means cities. And so if we're depopulating and draining our wealth creating engine, what does that do to the economy long run? So for as an individual choice, it makes sense and I understand it. But the macro effect is we're depopulating these wealth generating uh, places. I mean, just take any downtown area. It could be Melbourne or Adelaide or Sydney or, or New York for that matter. If, if there's a, an attractive downtown office building, let's say you're a large company, insurance company, whatever, and you used to have 10 floors as your corporate headquarters. Well, now everyone's been working from home for almost a year. That's that's nothing that anyone would have recommended, uh, you know, a year ago. But we were forced to do it, and guess what? It works. Uh, employers it works. and employees are finding that hey, it works. You can communicate and get stuff done, and maybe it's, there's some attractions to it. So this work from home thing is here to stay. Uh, what yeah. companies will do? They'll say, well, instead of ten floors, I only need two floors, and I'll have attractive offices. But they'll you'll reserve them. You'll call up say, hey, I need an office two days next week to meet some clients done they'll build locker rooms they won't be like high school locker rooms they'll be very attractive <laughs> you'll keep your laptop and your sweater and your scarf or whatever in your locker you'll show up take your stuff out of your locker it, it some receptionists will tell you which office is yours for those two days set yourself up meet your clients go home and work from home what does that mean if you cut uh commercial real estate capacity or utilization by 80 percent uh, we'll start with the cleaning crew and the reception but what about the food trucks the restaurants the shopping the public transportation uh, drinks after work, um, you know, on and on and on. All the things that are ancillary to that downtown office location, you cut that by 50 to 80 percent. What is that doing to your economy? So these are examples. And by the way, this will take a year to play out. This is not an overnight thing. Uh, so uh, the tenants are not paying rent. If they are, they've called up and negotiated a 50 percent increase. I'm, I'm, I have some involvement in commercial real estate and I, I see this in real time. So rents are down by perhaps half or all the way to zero if they're not paying. Everyone says, well, you know, landlords are rich. No, they're not. The landlords 
take the rents, but they have mortgages. So if the tenants aren't paying the landlords, the landlords can't pay the mortgagee uh, and that falls on the banks, right? Uh, except the banks are clever. They've securitized it and sold it probably to, to you and me, right? Looking your, look, we have our 401ks, like a superannuation fund, but you look in the fund and do you have some, uh, you know, a commercial real estate uh, REIT or something that Morgan Stanley sold you? Well, maybe you do. And what's inside? No one knows, but take a look. Um, so, but that ripple effect I just described can take a year to play out. So we haven't seen the end of this. So the bottom line on all this is that interest rates are going up in anticipation of inflation based on handouts. The reality is the handouts are not being spent, they're being saved, which does nothing for inflation. And it's also not sustainable, which is what are you gonna do? Hand out a $2 trillion deficit spending package every six months? Because that's kind of what we've been doing since last summer. And they keep saying, well, this is the last one, it'll be sustainable. It's not sustainable. It's a handout and people need the money but if they put it in the bank, which they're doing, this is a classic liquidity trap. So what's going to happen? Yeah. But meanwhile, meanwhile, the interest rates are going up, perhaps for the wrong reason, but they're going up. That's going to slow the economy further. We're already seeing mortgage applications dry up. Uh, we're seeing the housing bubble, not bubble, but pretty steep increase in, the, in residential housing starting to level up. So by, um, you know, hard to say, but I would say by March or April, this whole thing is going to go in reverse. Everything we just talked about is going to go in reverse. The economy is not going to have the traction. Unemployment is going to remain high. Velocity is going to continue to drop. There's not going to be any inflation. Those interest rates are headwind. They're going to drop and the price of gold is going to shoot up. So my advice to uh, the potential gold investors is uh, it's on sale. Uh, go get some right now. Uh, it's always better to buy low and sell high. And uh, <laughs> but I would expect the price to be much higher by mid-year. I know that you've said this before, or I'm pretty sure you've said this before, that to stimulate an economy, you need to reduce interest rates by somewhere around three, four percent to have an effect. When interest rates are currently at zero, how can you do that? Where do you go from zero? Well, a couple of things. Uh, the, the short answer is you can't. You, 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 in theory, you can go to negative rates, but negative rates don't work. We have experience from um, uh, the ECB, uh, Sweden, Japan, Switzerland, and elsewhere that negative rates don't work. They're, they're negative rates, but they don't, it's not more of the same. Cutting rates from 3% to you know zero has a beneficial effect, but cutting them from zero to negative one, now you're through the looking glass. You don't get any more pop. You don't get any more bang for the buck. And there are reasons for that, which are what, as a central bank, what signal are you sending? Well, see, the idea of negative rates is you're going to spend the money because if I'm going to take it away, you put money in the bank, even at zero, you put money in the bank, you go away for a year, come back, the same amount of money should be there. That's the zero interest rate. But a negative interest rate, negative 1%, you put $100,000 in the bank, you go away for a year, you come back, you only have $99,000. Because I took $1,000, that's 1% negative interest. So the idea is that I'm going to take your money, you're going to spend it fast because you don't want me to take your money. Uh, and that's going to have the stimulative effect that we talked about. That's not actually what happens. What happens, two things. Number one, uh, people have lifetime goals, um, their retirement, their health care, their parents' health care, their children's education, buying a house. There's some large lifetime goal you have, and that's why you save money in the first place. If I'm taking your money away, you're going to save more, not less. You, you, still, you still want to achieve that goal. I've made it more difficult, but you're actually going to save more. They want you to spend it, but now you're saving more. And the second thing is, what signal is a central bank sending when they have negative interest rates? They're mm. saying that they're worried about deflation, not inflation, mm. but deflation. Yeah. So if they're telling me, if Central Bank is telling me that deflation is a problem, I'm going to wait. And why should I buy anything right now? Wait till the price drops. Um, and by the way, a negative interest rate, negative 1%, my example, is a nominal uh, phenomena. But in real terms, if you have deflation, my money is worth more. So even though my dollar amount may be less, my purchasing power went up because prices went down. And so negative, that's why negative interest rates don't work because A, you're sending a deflation mm -hmm. signal so people defer spending and B, they have lifetime goals so they actually save more. So negative rates don't work. So you see, so you're right, you're stuck at zero, there you are. I mean, you can do QE, you can do quantitative easing. Um, and usually what happens is they hand the ball over, I don't know if it's a rugby match or whatever, but they, they hand the ball from monetary policy, which is now impotent, to fiscal policy, which is deficit spending. 
Uh, but there you have you have other kinds of headwinds having to do with very high, um, very high debt levels. More to the point, uh, in terms of you know what a what a central bank can actually do, they they can stimulate. They they can print money, uh, and governments can spend money and incur deficit spending. But again, none of it does any good if uh, if people don't actually spend it. And that's a psychological phenomenon. And the Fed or the Reserve Bank of Australia uh, or any central bank can print money, uh, no doubt about it. But they can't change people's psychology. You need, we had an external shock, an exogenous shock in the form of the pandemic that caused people to stop spending, save more, or they were unemployed. Or you know, if you're the unemployed individual, you're, you're not taking your friends out for dinner these days. Uh, you're putting money in the bank. And even if you still have your job, um, you're going to save money because you're worried you might be next. You might be the next one to get laid off or your company might shut down next week or next month. And so you're going to save more. It's what economists call precautionary savings or, you know, in plain English, saving for a rainy day. Um, and that's what's going on. It's going on going on uh, all over the world. This banking crisis is far from over. All the dominoes never fall at once. They fall sequentially. And sometimes there are time gaps between them. And everyone says, oh, all, all good. It's not all good. You have to look behind the curtain of the international monetary system, understand what's actually going on. These failures are symptoms more so than the real problem. Uh, the real problem has to do with tight money. Interest rates are five percent; they're going to be, you know, five and a quarter. But that is the uh, a year or just over a year ago, March 2022, they were zero. Uh, so you go from zero to five and a quarter percent in about one year. That's extraordinary. I mean, people remember Paul Walker raised interest rates to 20 percent, and he did. But that played out over a couple of years. This is five percent in, in one year, and the Fed's not done. I mean, they're saying uh, we're, we're going to think about it. We want to look at more data, but they have not said we're done. This whole pivot narrative has been wrong for a year, and it's it's wrong now. This banking crisis is far from over. What a great news to start our day, eh? Jim Rickard said that the banks will never fail all at once. You have to be cognizant of the situation, like the market condition, public confidence, and of course, the interest rates. One of the easiest indicators of a healthy economy is the interest rates. If the economy is in a red-hot inflation, then the Fed has to raise interest rates in order to cool down spending and encourage the public to save money because they will earn more interest with their bank. The Fed has raised interest rates from half a percent to 5.33% in just one year, the fastest and highest in the history of Federal Reserve. But the inflation hasn't come down yet so the Fed has to keep raising the interest rates. This whole pivot narrative has been wrong for over a year, Jim Rickard said. The Fed will never do a pivot. Pivot means stop raising the interest rate and instead start cutting it down. The Fed will keep raising the interest rates until they bring inflation down. A good bank risk manager will think, the Fed is raising the interest rates, it means the bond price is going down, I think I should sell my bond so that all of my bank deposits will not lose any value because of the bond prices going down, but instead these bank managers do the opposite so people will take their money from the bank. Jim Rickards said it will be worse than the 2008 global financial crisis. Let's hear more from Jim. So we have tight money, we have uh, underwater bonds, we have bank management who don't know the first thing about risk management. If you knew anything about risk management, once the Fed said, hey, we're going we're gonna to raise rates until we kill inflation. And that is what they said. Jay Powell gave eight speeches between the summer of 2022 and recently. And he said that every single time. Well, if you're a bank risk manager and you hear that, you're like, huh, I got bonds. Interest rates go up, bond prices go down. I understand their unrealized losses unless I sell them if they're in what's called a hold to maturity account, but they're still losses and it still destroys confidence. Now bank runs today, you know, you don't have to line up around the corner in the rain, you know, with your hat on waiting for to see the teller. You can just do it with your iPhone uh, and to the tune of you can move a billion dollars with your iPhone if you, you know, with the right accounts and passwords and all that. And so that's what happens. So the bank bank runs are instant instantaneous um, and uh, and they're far from over. So yes, yeah, it'll you know, kind of in a quiet period, but there'll be more. Uh, and uh, the good uh, analog, uh, Matt, is um, the 2008 financial crisis. Everyone remembers, you know, September 15th, 2008, midnight on a Sunday, Lehman Brothers files for bankruptcy. And that's true, but that started in the spring of 2007. Uh, when HSBC reported disappointing earnings based on mortgage losses and then came to a head in August 
uh, two Bear Stearns hedge funds failed. Uh, there were high high yield mortgage funds uh, at the end of July, August. Uh, the, the Fed raised a discount rate. It took a, a, a full year, another 13 months, to get to Lehman Brothers. And what happened along the way? Bear Stearns in March 2008. Fannie Mae went bankrupt in June 2008. Freddie Mac bankrupt in June 2008. Congress bailed out the system in August 2008, and then Lehman Brothers. So, uh, so that took a year and a half, and there are a lot of crises like that. So we're we're in a we're in falling dominoes. It's not over. It'll get a lot worse, um, and uh, people should prepare for that. But as usual, they don't. They people are very complacent. Wall Street says it's all good, and people believe it, but they shouldn't. Jim Rickards has explained the current predicament that we're in. It's the tight money policy because of the high interest rates. This situation is very similar to what we had back in 2008 when Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac got bankrupt because the Fed is raising the interest rates. It's similar to what we have now, where the interest rates is very high and the banks are hesitant to lend money to anybody. So, how the situation will end? Spoiler alert, it's far worse than you thought. Well, it either ends when, um, uh, well, it can end two ways. One is something like 2008 but worse, just a generalized global financial crisis where um, everybody's getting the money out of every bank, either buying treasury bills. Uh, you know, treasury bills at a brokerage firm are pretty safe because it's not about the brokerage firm. Brokerage firms fail all the time, but they have to segregate uh, house house fund, proprietary funds and customer funds. Um, money market funds, same thing in the sense that in 2008, uh, the, the, um, the government proved that they were willing to bail out money market funds. I mean, and they did, guaranteed every money market fund in the country. So it, uh, the best safe haven is, is gold, as a physical gold. Uh, bullion, coins or bars, uh, and silver. It's not digital, you can't hack it, you can't steal it, and you can't freeze it. You just put it in a safe place. So uh, eh, Americans don't really get gold, they don't really understand it. So yeah, I think it's just going to be question hopping, frog hopping from lily pad to lily pad looking for a safe place. The other scenario is that the government just throws in the towel and says, okay, all deposits are guaranteed in unlimited amounts. And I knew people who were trying to get $8 billion out of Silicon Valley Bank on that. Uh, they sent the wire structures on Thursday night. One guy I talked to said, uh, hey, Jim, we, from Thursday night to Sunday, we didn't know where the money was. Uh, we, we sent the wire instructions. We were trying to get it out, uh, but we didn't know what the outcome was going to be, whether it was short or not, wire sent or not. And then Sunday night, the Fed and the FDIC came out and said, all good. We're going to, you know, business as usual, open Monday. And. It's all good. He said the money went through, but um, that was what you know people were facing, and they'll they'll continue to face. I mean, the the banks you mentioned, I don't know what their deposit flows are right now, but my guess is they're shrinking fast. People are getting their money out, um, and so uh, you might just have to give a generalized blanket deposit insurance protection, uh, and that would stop bank runs in theory. But then. Now you basically nationalize the U.S. banking system. You look mm -hmm. like Argentina. So there are no, I guess the way to put it, Matt, there are no good outcomes. Either there's a catastrophe worse than 2008 that starts to look like 1931, 32, or the government offers so much protection that they've de facto nationalized the banking system. But the one thing I've noticed is that each crisis gets bigger than the one before, and each bailout is bigger than the one before. And the question I'm asking as an analyst is, are, are, we, are, are we at the point where the crises are so big, it's bigger than the Fed? In other words, we're not really talking about bailing out a bank or a sector. People lose confidence in the dollar itself. And we do seem to be heading in that direction. Jim Rickards said the crisis will get bigger than the one before. In 1999, Wall Street bailed out the market, and in 2008, the Fed bailed out Wall Street. And now, who will bail out the Fed? Jim proposed the idea of the dollar collapse. People often misunderstand the concept of the end of the dollar as the global reserve currency and as a payment currency. Let's listen to what Jim Rickards has to say. But I find there's a lot of confusion on the topic. And the confusion comes from the fact that people don't, everyone talks about the end of the dollar, or the, the dollar is going away as a global reserve currency, etc. But people don't distinguish between the role of the dollar as a payment currency and the role of the dollar as a reserve currency. And those are two very different things. There are some linkages. But a payment currency, basically, if I want to buy goods and services from you uh, and I tender some form of currency and you're willing to accept it and you're confident someone else will accept it from you, that's a good payment currency. It could be dollars, it could be euros or yuan, or it could be 
Russian rubles or Brazilian rice or, or anything, as long as people are willing to accept it, have confidence in it. A reserve currency is a very different thing. First of all, we don't really have reserve currencies. You know, you go to the People's Bank of China, they don't have $100 bills stacked up in the basement. What they own are U.S. Treasury securities, which are digital, by the way. The last paper Treasury security was issued, I think, around 1979. So what they have are, are actually securities. So when people say reserve currency, what they really mean is securities that hold your reserves denominated in a currency. So, of course, treasury securities are denominated in dollars, but they don't have actual dollars, you know, in a bank account or a physical form. They own securities. Now, as far as the payment currency is concerned, that's relatively easy to displace. This is what all the news is about. So the BRICS, uh, you know, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Uh, they're working on a new payment currency and that we're likely to see a big rollout of that this coming August. Don't know exactly what it'll be. They're working behind the scenes. It could be commodity backed. It could be gold backed. I'm not predicting that, but that's certainly one of the possibilities that we need to look at. But there is one thing that could knock the dollar off, which is gold. The gold is just gold. If you have physical gold, bullion or coins, you don't need all that other stuff. You just put it in a safe place and guard it, you know, like Fort Knox or whatever the Russians and Chinese have their equivalents um, and just sit on it. It's not digital. You can't hack it. You can't freeze it, etc. So if someone said, so the idea of the dollar losing ground as a payment currency is completely plausible. It'll happen in stages and it's happening already. The idea of the dollar losing its role as a reserve currency, um, it's not going to lose it to another currency, but it could lose it to gold. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before, and it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, in 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good, Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's going to get the memo, they're going to cut rates, the pivot, and buy stocks. The bond market is saying no. This is bad and it's going to get worse and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. But what happens is as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or, or, or less. The economy is in a huge mess. Jim Rickard said that this is the best single indicator of a recession. An inverse yield curve is when a yield on a 30-year bond is lower than a 10-year bond. Simply put, you get more money by saving it in less time. Normally, you should get more money when you save it for longer because the risk is bigger. You have to wait for more time in order to get your money back. But instead, investors prefer the shorter bond because they're afraid that the economy might be in a recession, meaning that the economy is slowing down. Jim Rickard said that there are at least three markets, the stock market, the bond market, and the real market. If the economy is in a recession, stocks and bond markets usually know it later, but the real market knows it first. When the sales go down, they have to cut costs. And eventually, they have to fire their employees. Entrepreneurs and small businesses know it best when it comes to the state of the economy because I believe that Jerome Powell never bought groceries by himself. So, how could interest rates go up if we're in a recession? The fact is that the interest rate is a lagging indicator. Let Jim Rickards explain it to you. Interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get close to recession, who, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, um, or even medium-sized businesses. They see it. A lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now, and the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, it's a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the terms. I don't want material adverse clause, clause adverse change clauses kicking in. I said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits and the bankers go, huh, What's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then, then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards. They stop doing loss. And then interest rates will start to come down. But the interest rates peak after the recession be, has already begun. Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks. Bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then there's what I call the reality. What I see is, is a kind of a hybrid the Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. 
Okay, they're they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened. They're going to keep going for the reasons I explained. That means they're going to make it worse. They're going to make the recession even worse. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Uh, attention spans seem to be short these days, but it was not long ago. Go back and look at look at a chart, uh, any stock index chart from October 1st, 2018 to, to December 24th, 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%, culminating in the Christmas Eve massacre, December 24th, 2018, when it dropped, I think NASDAQ dropped like 3% in one day. Now, here's the point. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh they don't care that much about the stock market level. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. And that's the key word. It's not if stocks are going down, but it's you know, kind of a little, you know, half a percent a day, one percent a day, trending down, lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30% in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008, I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly, but not just because they're going down. Jim Rickard said that the Federal Reserve will only care enough if it's a disorderly collapse, meaning if the markets, either stocks or bonds, are going down like 30% in just two weeks. If it's just a little plunge in a day like a 5% drop in Amazon stocks then the Fed won't care about it. But what the Fed and everybody is missing is the state of the economy itself. The unemployment rate is at its worst now, and massive layoffs in the tech industry are in the news everywhere. Because of what, you might ask? Yes, you are correct, it's because of the high interest rates. The companies need to pay more for the interest on their debt, so they have to reduce their headcount. At the same time, their revenue decreased because consumers unsubscribed from their services because of the rising prices everywhere, whether it's groceries, gas, or even food. So yeah, everything will go south I guess. Now here's what the Fed is uh, is missing, or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't, why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent. You'll turn down the lights, you know, you know, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes. Um, and then by the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like, oh, I've done everything I can. Now my business is in jeopardy. I have to fire some people. So that, and then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, et cetera. It's a lagging indicator. We know enough right now to know that number's going up this spring. But that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. Now, having said that, what else is the Fed missing? Well, wages are up 5% yeah. on an annualized basis, 5.2% on an annualized basis. I'm like, yeah, and inflation's 7% or 6%. So your real wage just went down one or two points. Because when, when, the, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports those wage numbers, those are nominal numbers. I'm not saying they're fake. But you have to know that they're nominal and you have to subtract inflation to find out what's happening to real wages. And the answer is real wages have been going down for a couple of years because um, they're, they're, it runs around 5% annualized, give or take. Sounds like a 5% raise, what, what do you want? Well, yeah, but with 8 9% inflation or even 6% inflation, um, your real wage is going down. So that's not a, a robust number at all. The Fed, by the way, the Fed wants to make, make it worse. The Fed agrees 
that uh, those wage gains are too high. But my point is, in real terms, they're actually going down, but the Fed wants them to go down more. That, that's, that would be one way to put it. If you get inflation down and, and wages are constant, then the real wage goes up relative to where it was before. Uh, but if you're unemployed, you have no wage. So that's that's another issue. Now, what the Fed is missing, and it's a long list, but uh, there's something called the labor force participation rate. Now, the labor force participation rate, you just take the number of people working divided by the total working age population. It's all, it's all you do. It's not sophisticated. Um, and that number today is around 61.2, uh, 61, give or take, uh, percent. But as recently as um, 2000, that, that number was over 70%. Uh, and it has come down ever since. And it's, it dropped like a stone during uh, 2020, during the pandemic lockdown. Came back a little bit, but not much. The reason it got, first of all, it's never 100%. It shouldn't be. There are legitimate reasons to be working age population, not working. You're, um, you're a homemaker. You're a, a student. You know, there's, there's a bunch of perfectly good reasons. So it's never 100%, not even close. But 70 is pretty high and 60 is pretty low. Uh, so, and the, the trend has been down. So that leaves, uh, relative to kind of a normalized number, that leaves about 8 to 10 million people between the ages of 25 and 54 who are not in the workforce. There's a big untapped labor pool. But if you throw, if you took that group and threw it into the unemployment numbers, the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates it, unemployment would be about 9%. And yes. that's a, that's a depression level of unemployment. Mike, you're looking at a recession, kind of looks like the global financial crisis and hope it doesn't. And there's a difference between extreme recession and financial crisis. They're two different things, but they can happen at the same time as as did happen in 2008. Would the Fed back off if it became apparent that they were going to cause a stock market crash, a disorderly collapse, and a severe recession? The answer is almost certainly yes, but the problem is it might happen uh, right. a- anyway. And I was, they, they might have gone too far, and this almost happened in 2018, and that was my mm-hmm. point. It was that by the by the time they realize their mistake, it might already be too late. So that's one danger, which you, if they if they had perfect information, oh, gee, we went too far, gee, we couldn't pull this off, we need to back off, they might back off exactly as you described, but they don't have perfect information. They have flawed models. They tend not to look at history. And they could- Behind the curve. They could crash the car before they knew it was out of control. It's like s- slamming on the brakes on ice. You can slam on the brakes, but you're going to go for a long time before the car stops. So that's one problem. This, the second problem is you you have to separate, as I said, recession, even severe recessions from financial crises. In 1998, we had a financial crisis, but no recession. Uh, in 1994, we had a financial crisis, no recession. In 2000 and 2020, we had a severe recession, no financial crisis. That was not a financial crisis. In 2000, 2001, we had a, the, the NASDAQ collapsed 80%, but there was only a very mild recession and that was not a financial crisis. So the Fed might say, and again, might, cause who knows, but they might say, well, of course we don't want a financial crisis. Now to your point, Nick, nobody wants that and they do get out of control, but we're not worried about that. You know, we learned our lesson in 2008. We had Dodd-Frank uh, and I had this discussion with the uh, uh, James Gorman is the CEO of uh, Morgan Stanley. I briefed their board, and they they gave me a lot of pushback. They said, "Oh, you don't understand, Jim. We've we've uh, we've you know we have more capital and greater liquidity and less leverage and better credit." And I I granted. I said, you, "You're absolutely right. It's a nice job. You're a stronger bank now than you were then." But in a financial crisis, it doesn't matter. The the, the problem is systemic. In other words, as an individual bank, you may be better off. But if the whole system's collapsing, you can't necessarily withstand that. So they they don't want that. But what if they said to themselves, you know what? We don't want a financial crisis, but we don't think that's going to happen. But we'll but maybe we'll just have to bear a recession. Volcker knew what he was doing. Volcker knew that there was going to be a recession, and the recession of 1981-82 that he caused was at the time the worst since the Great Depression. Now, we've surpassed that twice since then, uh, 2008 and uh, 2020, although it's hard it's hard to know what 2020 was. I mean, down 36% in two months and up 38% in the next two months. I mean, what what is that? But uh, 
but at least in technical terms, um, we've had two worse recessions, 20, 2008 and 2020 since then. But at the time, and I, I began to live through that, I was around, uh, that was the worst recession. But Volcker knew that would happen. He said, that's the price we have to pay to break the back of inflation. And he did. And by 1986, inflation was like 2% or 1.8%. Now, there was far less worry about financial crises at the time. Uh, because remember, this was before the repeal of Glass-Steagall. You know, commercial banks, no one really cared about investment banks. They could fail. So what? They cared about the commercial banks, and they had a pretty good handle on that. Um, so they weren't worried about financial crisis, but today you would be, uh, be for the reasons we mentioned. So the so there are two possible major blunders here, but again, don't under, underestimate the Fed's ability to do both. One <laughs> one is that they could they could decide they don't want a recession, but not know until too, until it was too late. They just tighten into it, don't know it until it's too late, and then the damage is done. The other one is they could sign up for a recession, say, yeah, sorry, but that's the price of getting inflation under control and trigger a financial crisis that nobody wants, but could happen anyway. So, you know, it's kind of so and crib this, uh, you know, take your pick. Severe recession, but we know it's coming. Recession that causes a financial crisis that we didn't want, or just let the inflation rip. What's the good outcome there? What, what's the good one? Yeah. But I think I think those are the three choices. I think you're right. People say America has never defaulted on a step. Well, first of all, that's not true. It's not a true statement. But the the easiest, quietest, stealthiest way to default is inflation. It's like, hey, here's your billion dollars back. You know, good luck buying a loaf of bread because I destroyed the value of the dollar. And so now three percent. Um, we'll do it in. Um, do the math. We'll do that in about 22 years. At 10 percent, you you cut the value of the dollar in half in seven years. Uh, by the way, that is what happened between 1977 and 1981. In that five-year period, uh, the dollar lost over 50% of its purchasing power. According to Jim Rickards, hyperinflation is coming to America, and the raising of interest rates won't be able to help fight inflation. In fact, it will make inflation even worse. Inflation will impact stock market as Jim Rickards think it will bring the economy into recession, and unemployment will go up to 4 or maybe even 5%. But all Jerome Powell can say is, too bad, that's painful and we have to get there, but we're gonna pay higher prices if we don't. And then there's the myth of 2% inflation. The Federal Reserve have something called inflation targeting, where if they fail to have at least 2% inflation per year then it means the economy is going into deflation, or to put it simply, the economy is slowing down and therefore unemployment is gonna go up and the economy will go into recession. In order to prevent that from happening, the Federal Reserve have to target the inflation to at least 2% per year in order to bring price stability to the market and to keep the economic wheel running smooth. At least that's the theory, but to Jim Rickards it doesn't make any sense. The Fed have raised interest rates way too high but the inflation is not going down yet. In fact, inflation goes way up even higher than before. People said between 1913 and 2023, the dollar has lost 95% of its value, but we don't need to wait for another 110 years. Jim Rickards explains that in the 1980s, the dollar loses half of its value in just five years. Will it do that again? Will the economy goes into recession? Let's find out. A lot of people like to bang the table and say, you know, since since the creation of the Fed in 1913, the dollar has lost 95% of its purchasing power. Well, that's a true statement, but you don't need 110 years. We lost 50% in five years between 1977 and 1982. So inflation is insidious. It is a tax. Uh, it is a form of theft. But like the kid with the mother's wallet, if you keep the theft, you know, in small little bites, but do it long enough, you can get the whole thing and no one will notice. So they say we want 2% because uh, we want to be able to cut if we have to. But the real reason is we want to basically erode the value of the debt and erode the purchasing power of the dollar in ways that you don't notice. And and they can be very patient. And that's how they do it. But to your point, Addison, well, hasn't the Fed been raising interest rates? Yes. But real rates are still negative. So if inflation's nine and the Fed's at two, the real rate is negative seven. That's, that's a really, really low interest rate. And if you say, okay, inflation's come down to six and the Fed's up to 
you know, four, uh, about four and a half right now. Um, so the real rate is now negative one and a half in my example. Um, well, that's a lot less than, than seven, but still a negative real rate. We are not in the world of positive real rates. So then the question is, okay, how how is the Fed doing at getting inflation to the target? The, the 2% we talked about, we explained why that's their number. And this says a lot about what's going on in the stock market right now, because you go all the way back to August 26, 2022. That was Jay Powell's Jackson Hole speech. And he said, inflation's, at, you know, not, he didn't use the word out of control, but he said inflation's way too high. We're going to bring it down to our 2% target. Um, we know unemployment's going to go up. We know he will probably have recession. He did not use the R word. He didn't say recession, but he said, you know, growth will suffer. Unemployment will go up. That's just a fancy way of saying there's going to be a recession. And we're not going to stop until we get there. Uh, and so in other words, too bad, you know, unemployment's going to go up to some number. I don't know what, four or five percent, which is pretty high. It's, it's right now it's uh, three point four, I believe, the lowest since 1969. So unemployment's going to go up. The economy's going to go into recession. But too bad. That's the price we all have to pay to get inflation down under control on the way to 2%. In other words, in the way Jay Powell rationalizes this, he said, yeah, that's painful. And we're going to pay a high price to get there. But we're going to pay a higher price if we don't. If we don't get to 2% and we let this thing spiral out of control and we even stay at 4 or 5% for a prolonged period of time, that the economic damage from that in terms of lost investment, misallocation of capital, basically people losing money on their investments, uh, is going to be much higher than maybe a short recession. Here's the interesting part. Jerome Powell scares the market with six speeches. He said the same thing again and again. We need to get to 2% inflation, which means raising the interest rates even more, and therefore we're going to have a recession and unemployment is going to go up. With the Fed being hawkish, the market should go down. Instead, the market got rallied because they believe inflation is going to go down soon. Jim Rickards think the Fed is already reached at something called the terminal rate, a rate which inflation will go down on its own so the Fed won't need to raise the interest rates any further. But the Fed keeps raising it and making the economy crash even further. So how is it going to end? When will the Fed needs to stop raising interest rates? Let's listen to what Jim Rickards have to say. So he said that the market didn't believe him. The market rallied. I uh, went down a little bit right around that time, but then the market rallied in October. And he comes out at the end of September, gives another speech at an FOMC meeting, comes out November 2nd, gives another speech, comes out November 30th, gives a speech at the Brookings Institution, uh, and then comes out in mid-December with another speech. And then again, a couple of weeks ago on uh, February 1st. So it's like six speeches in uh, about about five months. And he said the same thing every time. He said, we're getting to 2%. You know, believe believe me when I said, we're going to have a recession. Unemployment's going to go up. Too bad. We have a lot of work to do. We're not done. The market has flipped on and off. Half the time, the market doesn't believe me. I go, yeah, you say that. But uh, in fact, inflation is coming down faster than you thought. You're probably, uh, I should introduce a concept. Uh, I guess a lot of people have heard of it, but there's this new concept called the terminal rate. The Fed's trying to get to the terminal rate. And so what's the terminal rate? Well, no one actually knows what the number is. I don't know, but neither does Jay Powell. But it's a theory. And the theory is, okay, the, the, the terminal rate is a rate set by the Fed that's high enough to bring inflation down without further rate hikes. We get to a level and that level is high enough that inflation will come down on its own just by waiting without raising the rate again. And the conundrum, I hate to use that word, but it is a conundrum. The conundrum the Fed faces right now is they have been raising rates and inflation has been coming down. Those two things are true. But is inflation coming down because they're raising rates in which case maybe you want to keep raising them uh, or are you already at the terminal rate it's coming down on its own and now the danger is you're going to go too far and that's the debate with wall street and so wall street is sort of leaning to the view now you're probably already at the terminal rate inflation is coming down you need to back off you need to stop uh, and probably pivot this was the famous word for the last six months the pivot means you're, you're actually going to have to cut rates 
uh, because you have gone too far and you're going to cause a pretty bad recession. And so the expectation as recently as December was that the Fed would pivot around March or April. They would, yeah, they would raise in February, maybe March, but pretty quickly after that, they would cut rates. And if the Fed's cutting rates, buy stocks. You know, it's typical Wall Street analysis. It always ends with buy stocks, um, particularly tech stocks. So, with the current high interest rates environment and reckless government spending, what should we do to protect our money from inflation? Should we buy stocks? And what stocks should we buy? The Fed said it will raise the interest rates even further but the market thinks the opposite will happen, so who's right and wrong here? Let's hear what Jim Rickards think. Spoiler alert. This is not investment advice. But the Fed has been saying the opposite, so there's been this battle where Powell goes one, two, three, four, five, six speeches, says the same thing. We're not stopping. And Wall Street says, oh, yes, you are. So buy stocks. Well, who's right? Well, there's no saying on Wall Street, don't fight the Fed. I don't think of it as who's right or wrong. You could have an opinion. The way I think of it is I just want to know what you're going to do. Because if I know what you're going to do, then you can trade accordingly. You can plan for that and you can prepare for it. And what they're going to do is they're going to keep raising rates. Even if they're at the terminal rate already, I think they might be. Uh, even if they are, they don't think so. Their opinion counts for a lot more than mine, and they're going to keep going. But by the time inflation comes down enough to say, yeah, okay, we're at the terminal rate, nice job, it'll be too late. They will have gone too far because the Fed's always the last to know. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before, and it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good. Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's going to get the memo. They're going to cut rates, the pivot, and buy stocks. The bond market is saying, no, this is bad, and it's going to get worse, and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. But what happens is, as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or, or, or less. So, uh, so that's like a, that's like a, you know, a big red siren, a flashing light, whatever you want to call it. Interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get closer to recession, who knew, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, um, or even medium-sized businesses. Um, they see it. Uh, uh, you know, if you're in the trucking business, it's it's real time. Inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed. You're not moving anything by truck. A lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now, and the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business uh, heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, it's a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the terms. I don't want material adverse clause, clause adverse change clauses kicking in. Instead, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits and the bankers go, aha, uh -huh, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards, they stop doing loss, and then interest rates will start to come down. But the interest rates peak after the recession be, has already begun. So uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. Um, and then uh, there's what I call the reality. What I see is, is a kind of a hybrid the Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay, they're they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened. They're going to keep going for the reasons I explained. That means they're going to make it worse. They're going to make the recession even worse. And they may pivot uh, to say that there could be a rate cut um, it won't be in April, but, you know, rate cut in August, maybe. I wouldn't rule that out, but for a really bad reason. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. They over tightened. They didn't look at the forward indicators I described. 
and they found out too late, then they have to slam on the brakes or take the foot off the brake, if you will, in terms of rate hikes and then pivot. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Uh, attention spans seem to be short these days, but it was not long ago. Go back and look at, look at a chart, uh, any stock index chart from October 1st, 2018 to, to December 24th, 2018, um, less than three months. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%, culminating in the Christmas Eve massacre, December 24th, 2018, when it dropped, I think NASDAQ dropped like 3% in one day. Now, here's the point. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about the stock market level. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. And that's the key word. It's not if stocks are going down, but it's, you know, kind of a little, you know, half a percent a day, 1% a day, trending down, lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30% in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008, I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly, but not just because they're going down. So there may be a pivot, you know, in late August, but, or, you know, July thereabouts, but not because of Goldilocks, but because it's not a soft landing, it's a crash landing. But real quick, I guess, let's stick on the recession just for one second, because there's the, um, you know, bad recessions generally come along with, um, with a lot of job losses. Do you see, given that this recession could be worse than most are expecting right now, there being, you know, wide scale layoffs of the sort we've seen in some of the bad, the, the worst, the bad previous recessions like 08, like 01? The answer is yes. First of all, we're seeing it already. Um, so, you know, I don't match the company to the exact number, but layoffs on order of magnitude 10,000 to 20,000 terminated employees at Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, um, you know, and other other tech names. Uh, it affects other sectors as well, but tech in particular has engaged in a massive series of layoffs. Um, and so people go, well, wait a second, how come the it hasn't shown up in the unemployment numbers? Because the uh, the unemployment rate is uh, it's around 3.5, 3.6, on the exact number. It's right in that neighborhood, 3.5, 3.6. We haven't seen that level of unemployment that low, that is, since the 1960s. This isn't like oh, a good year or a good debt, you know, this is the lowest since the 1960s. And so, and the Fed is absolutely looking at that. You're right about that, Adam. And they're saying, uh, and of course they believe in the Phillips curve, which is junk science, but the Phillips curve, for those who are not familiar, says there's an inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation. So if unemployment is high, inflation is low. And if unemployment comes down, inflation goes up. And so if you want to get inflation down, you should expect to bring unemployment up. That's what the Fed believes. What I just said is nonsense. It's not true. It's junk. But the Fed believes it. Uh, again, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the Fed thinks. They so say you got to put yourself in their minds to figure it out. So as far as they're concerned, that kind of those kind of unemployment numbers, lowest since the 1960s, that's inflationary. They got to get those numbers up. Now, here's what the Fed is uh, is missing, or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't, why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent. You'll turn down the lights, you know, you know, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes. Um, and then by the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like, oh, I've done everything I can. Now my business is 
in jeopardy, I have to fire some people. So that, and then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, et cetera, it's a lagging indicator. We know enough right now to know that number's going up this spring, but that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. Now, having said that, what else is the Fed missing? Well, wages are up 5% yeah. on an annualized basis, 5.2% on an annualized basis. I'm like, yeah, and inflation's 7% or 6%, so your real wage just went down one or two points. Because when, when, the, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports those wage numbers, those are nominal numbers. I'm not saying they're fake, but you have to know that they're nominal and you have to subtract inflation to find out what's happening to real wages. And the answer is real wages have been going down for a couple of years because um, they're, they're, it runs around 5% annualized, give or take. Sounds like any 5% raise, what, what do you want? Well, yeah, but with 8 9% inflation or even 6% inflation, um your real wage is going down so that's not a, a robust number at all the fed by the way the fed wants to make make it worse the fed agrees that uh, those wage gains are too high but my point is in real terms they're actually going down but the fed wants them to go down more that, that's that would be one way to put it if you get inflation down and and wages are constant then the real wage goes up relative to where it was before uh but if you're unemployed, you have no wage. So that's that's another issue. Now, what the Fed is missing, and it's a long list, but uh, there's something called the labor force participation rate. Now, the labor force participation rate, you just take the number of people working divided by the total working age population. It's all, it's all you do. It's not sophisticated. Um, and that number today is around 61.2%, uh, 60, give or take a uh, percent. But as recently as um, 2000, that, that number was over 70%. Uh, and it's come down ever since. And it's, it dropped like a stone during uh, 2020, during the pandemic lockdown. Came back a little bit, but not much. The reason it got, first of all, it's never 100%. It shouldn't be. There are legitimate reasons to be working age population, not working. You're, um, you're a homemaker. You're a, a student. Uh, you're an early retiree. Right. Uh, you're in the military. Yeah. You're in the, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of perfectly good reasons. So it's never 100%, not even close. But 70 is pretty high and 60 is pretty low. Uh, so, and the, the trend has been down. So that leaves, uh, relative to kind of a normalized number, that leaves about eight to 10 million people between the ages of 25 and 54 who are not in the workforce. There's a big untapped labor pool. But if you throw, if you took that group and threw it into the unemployment numbers, the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates it, unemployment would be about 9%. And yes. that's, a, that's a depression level of unemployment. The supply chain was breaking down before COVID. Now, of course, COVID made it worse, yes. Uh, and the war in Ukraine made it worse yet, yes. But this really started with Trump's trade war in 2018. So um, that, like I said, there's a thread that runs through all these things. So uh, not to throw out my hands, I'm not going to do that. But um, when you ask me that, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, you want to talk about China, Ukraine, supply chain, Biden, they're, they're all they're all a big deal. If, if um, you know, in terms of tragedy, probably uh, the war in Ukraine is the most important because it's highly, highly significant economically and strategically. But of course, it's a human tragedy going with it. You know, if Chinese real estate implodes, okay, there's some hardship here and there, but it's not like uh, people being killed or maimed or forced into refugee status. And that is uh, part of what's going on in Ukraine. So that's a, a that's probably the biggest single one, but I wouldn't uh, miss the fact that all these things are going on at once. The number one question, uh, of course, every, everyone's concerned about inflation, but uh, there's, there's a big backstory there. But I always say when it, when it comes to your own money, everybody has a PhD in economics. You don't need Larry Summers to tell you what's going on with your budget and your you know ability to feed your family or keep a roof over your head. So people get inflation. It's one of the reasons it's so politically toxic is because it's unavoidable. You can't fudge it. You can't spin it. It's like, hey, if I used to fill up my Ford F-150 truck for 50 bucks and now it's 125 bucks, A, you get it. It's right in your face. And B, that's 75 bucks that you don't have to take your spouse out to dinner, you know, buy a new jacket or whatever. Um, so there's kind of demand destruction at the same time you're spending more money on the one thing you can't do without. So so people get it. But then from there, the question I get the most is, hey, Jim, is this going to 
cause a recession? Are we going to have a recession? And I, as recently as a few months ago, I would say, yeah, I, I think so. You can see it coming late this year, early next year. Now I say, we're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. And and there's data. I you know, I never make statements like that, Brian, without supporting it. We know that um, the standard definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. There are a few more bells and whistles having to do with unemployment and, and a few other things, but that's that's the rule of thumb. So based on that, and based on the best available estimate for a second quarter, likely to be accurate, we're in a recession today. Now, it's not severe, but that's like saying I got, I'm in bed with a you know pneumonia, but I'm not dying. Well, okay, but uh, we're in a re- we're in a recession right now. Um, there's there's a lot of whistling past the graveyard. I mean, the stock market uh, is still you know, greatly overpriced. There's still, you know, the buy the dips mentality hasn't gone away. It's still there. You got people like Jim Cramer yelling, you know, buy Netflix or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, there's institutional support. Uh, there's momentum trading. Of course, 95% of the trading is by robots. So you got to reverse engineer the 27 year olds from Bangladesh who don't get out much. They're the ones really writing these algorithms. I mean, brilliant engineers, but you know, you'd have to show them around Wall Street. Um, but uh, so, so all that's going on. So we haven't really seen the real, the market collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out. It'll get worse as the year goes on. All right. So you're expecting a major correction in stock markets. On yeah, the back I'm of not alone. I mean, I mean that that is my expectation. I have my own models and I look at it closely. But if you listen to you know, Michael Berry, uh, Jeremy Grantham, uh, you know Charlie Munger, these people have been around and they they run, uh, you know, hundreds of billions, uh, and uh, they're saying the same thing. So you know, so every now and then someone will throw some statistic at me, and I go, well, "How long is your time series?" And I go, "Oh, we took it back five years." I was like. You know, talk to me if you've done it for 100 years, because that's a little more meaningful. But Jeremy Grantham actually did do a 100 year time series and looked at bubbles all over the world. You know, 1929, U.S., 1989, Japan, 2000, dot com stocks, you know, and, and many others. Um, and he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, it's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks and, and other asset classes. So, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, that, that is my view, but it's it's shared by a number of other analysts. And that would mean like S&P coming off another 20, 30 percent. Y- yes. Uh, and, and again, you remind you have to remind people um, 1929, the stock market fell 22 percent in two days. It wasn't one day. It was, you know, it was like 12 percent one day, 11 percent the next day. So 23 percent over two days. But that wasn't the crash. I mean, that was the beginning of the crash. This Dow Jones fell 82% from from top to bottom. Now it took three years. It, it bottomed in uh, June 1932. Uh, started in October 1929, so not quite three years. But uh, that fell 82%, and and that happened. So uh, so yeah, we're down. Uh, you know, Nasdaq's down. Uh, bounced back a little bit in recent days. Down close to 30% down the S&P down over 20 percent we're in bear market territory but that that's just the beginning that's not what a full bear market full you know market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that I expect talk to me about inflation because you know I was looking at some of the inflation numbers and you have to go back to the 80s to see anything that's approaching double digit you know I remember being a just a kid hearing about double digit inflation I could kind of remember the, the the gas pumps, you know, the lines at the gas, it's like a distant memory of me in the 70s. And But, you know, how do you talk to, you know, younger people these days about what inflation is or it means? Because I don't think people really grasp what it actually means to your savings or to the economy in an, even a medium term. Well, that's exactly right, Brian. And if you, um, uh, you know, you're you're a little younger than I am, but I I, I lived through it. I was uh, I, I started my career uh, in banking in 1976, and uh, so I start. I remember my uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking, and the inflation was so bad. You'd get a raise 
every like four or five months and you didn't have to ask they would just give it to you because they knew that you were going to quit if, if uh, they didn't keep up so she would get a raise and she was making more than i was at the time so we'd go out to dinner and then i would get a raise and i was making more than she was so we would just tease each other about that but that's how it was um and the psychology was you know if you needed a whatever you know a tv set or refrigerator new car or whatever you say i better buy it now because the price is going to be higher if i wait a month or two months the price is going to run away from me so it it had huge behavioral uh, effects uh, of course gold was you know going to the moon there, there was a lot going on at the time but but brian you're right when you say we're putting up inflation numbers today that are the highest in 40 years that is correct but i remind people the inflation in 1981 was the end of a 10-year period of inflation that was when volcker finally got it under control but you go back to 80 70 you know, 70 well, between 77 and 81, so that five-year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power. Not 15, 50. So the question is, is this the beginning of an inflationary surge where it's going to get even worse and it is going to last five years? Or is it is it different than that? But I but keep that in mind because the situation we're in today is very different from the 1970s. And I'll explain why. But um uh, well, let's explain why right now, because in the 70s, it was triggered from the supply side with first the Arab oil embargo in 1973 as a result of the, uh, uh, the 1973 Arab-Israeli war. Um, and then the price tripled, but it went from like you know, $2 to, to, uh, to, to $6. Okay. But, you know, percentage terms, that's a huge jump, but it was still $6. And then it got to 12. And then in 1979, you had a second oil embargo because of Iran and the Ayatollah and the revolution and the hostages and all that. And then it went from kind of 12 to 20. So uh, oil went up by a factor of 10 um, in the course of the late 70s for because there's two different embargoes. So that's coming from the supply side. But what happened was the other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off or there's an embargo or there's a shortage of natural disaster. A lot of things it's coming from the supply side and demand is inelastic. So you just pay up or, you know, kind of do without. Um, but the demand side is much more psychological. That's called uh, demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described. And as I said, I lived through the 70s um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today. I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So as that applies to today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course they're related. You know, it's like, oh, it's like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? You, to get the food, you got to fig, feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Huh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food, you got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That re requires diesel. The higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. Um, but but food prices are going up substantially. And you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So so you have that, um, that, that cost push inflation. We're not quite at the stage where it's demand pull. We're not quite at the stage where individual consumers are behaving the way I described in the 1970s saying, hey, better, better spend the money fast because it's, it's losing value. 